And now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Jennifer Root from Landscape Architecture Magazine. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Am I on? Great. Um, thank you so much for joining us today in, for Inside the LA Studio with Design Jones. Um, founded in 2009 by Diane Jones Allen, Design Jones is a landscape architecture, land planning, and urban recovery firm based in New Orleans' Lower Ninth Ward. Today we have two of the, firm, the firm's two principals with us, Diane Jones Allen, a landscape architect with a BFA from Washington University where she studied painting, an MLA from Berkeley where she studied under Randy Hester, and a doctorate in civil engineering. Before founding, founding Design Jones, Jones Allen was a principal of Terra Designs and taught at Morgan State University for 10 years. Her partner, Austin Allen, joined the firm in 2010. Mr. Allen is a filmmaker and an educator with a BLA from Berkeley and an MA and PhD from Ohio University. He divides his time between the firm and teaching as an associate professor of landscape architecture at the Robert Reich School of Landscape Architecture at LSU. So please uh, join me in welcoming Diane Jones Allen and Austin Allen today. So we're going to try and do this a little bit as a conversation, but um, I'm going to start off with a couple of um, questions. And the first thing I'd really like to talk to both of you about is um, to ask you to talk a little bit both about um, your early influences and the mentors and um, people who have informed the way that you practice today. It's not working. <laughs> All right, I can step over here and, and see if I can get this to dry for you. Let's see. There you go. There you go. Is it moving? It's just our screen. Oh, maybe. Okay. Yeah. It's moving. Okay. It's me. Okay. Can you guys hear her? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they can hear. I can. You first? So, oh, okay. <laughs> so thanks for coming. Um, so I, my background is um, painting. Actually, I, I was going to go off to the Winchester School, or either there was a school in um, Brussels. I actually was a, in Belgium. I was about to go off to, after I finished my painting degree, and before I was going in the fall, and um, and before I went, I um, I got this thing about coming up to Harvard for this career discovery six week program and I said okay I'll do that before I go off to Brussels and um, and that's where I discovered landscape architecture and it's just you know I didn't go to school <laughs> I went back and um, volunteered at um, the Department of um, um, Urban Design at Baltimore City Planning and then reapplied to school in landscape architecture and um, but the painting you know was actually really important and um, and I still paint today um, all the time. And it's funny because like these paintings, they're very like landscape or even though I'm not thinking about it and it just, you know, all that stuff's kind of connected. Um, not just like subject matter and the fact that I paint landscapes, but <laughs> the fact that, you know, the thing about color, form making, um, you know, I learned all that really. <coughs> I brought all that with me to the profession from um, um, landscape architecture. And as you can see, you know, for projects I draw all the time, this was, you know, sketches that you all have done <laughs> for projects in um, Annapolis I was working on. And so I really, I love, I love drawing, see, it helps me to see and to understand. And I also know, I always have my sketchbook, <laughs> I'm always drawing, but um, yeah. And so these are like, um, and this morning, one of the powerful things that were said, if you went to the um, opening session was about um, traveling, and that's really helped me. So I spent about three months in Tanzania, and these are from there. And um, you know, I spent and I went up and down East um, East Africa while I was there, Ethiopia, and um, I went Johan. I went from South Kenya, <laughs> but I was living in Tanzania. I was living in Marengo at the foot of the mountain in Kilimanjaro. I got to climb Kilimanjaro. So if you ever get to go to East Africa, go to Kilimanjaro. It's beautiful. Um, and there are environmental issues now. But anyway, so that's just to show like those things that um, influence me and still are important to things that I do, more paintings. 
Um, the, it was really interesting too because it's right. I mean, you get to learn about these diverse cultures, and I didn't realize there were Ethiopian Jews. So I met that that um, drawing in the bottom are the Ethiopian Jews, and um, like he was saying, we are so diverse. We're more than just this. <coughs> I mean, so <laughs> like you you got to see the world, and, and that kind of stuff helps me when I'm like anywhere here in the United States because you know you get to like really see beyond the surface. Anyway, so I'll stop. I'm gonna let oh, you. I would do it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can I? Oh, shit. Yeah, uh, this is uh, um, a video of the Livable Claiborne's community when we were, uh, uh, a project we were working on 2012 through about 2014. And uh, before I do, i just talk a little bit about some of the early influences that got me here, just, just for a minute, and then I'll get into this. Um, uh, one of the schools that got, uh, you know, uh, left out in terms of it was I, I did go to community college and I went at a very exciting time and I'm starting to look at some things uh, now currently about community colleges and their potential role uh, and I think it gets often overlooked for a lot of reasons I won't go into but uh, it was an urban studies degree that actually, you know, helped inspire some of the thinking that would happen later. Um, I had a lot of, uh, I think, inroads into landscape architecture that I didn't even understand were those inroads. And I, I think about a grandmother who was on a landmarks commission. I, I didn't know till she passed, but then I played back conversations and I realized her her, you know, real strong stand, uh, stance on preservation um, really stuck with me in, in uh, other kinds of ways. I had a uncle, Stafford Williams, who turned out was in school with Ed Price uh, at Ohio State for landscape architecture. And I, I could never figure out why I loved his backyard, which was different than everybody else's backyard ever. And he would always take all of us to the Emerald Necklace in Cleveland. Uh, I, I, I mean, we knew it backwards and forwards in terms of those hikes and everything. And, di and didn't know till I uh, had studied landscape architecture. And one day we were sitting, drinking a beer, and he said, yeah, I know Ed Price. And, <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know. So you, you have those influences. but. It, hasn't, it was not a profession that was talked about or that I had that kind of knowledge of until actually the day that I applied to go in, into landscape architecture. I thought about planning and ended up in landscape architecture. So back to this. This is uh, from the Livable Claiborne's community, which is about taking down uh, freeway infrastructure here in um, uh, New Orleans, only it became the non-subject matter. We couldn't really, you know, <laughs> so anyway. Oh, that's the other one, yeah. Talking about the geography, we're looking at an area that extends from the Legion. <laughs> oh, it's all right. <laughs> Fields, down along Rampart, O.C. Haley, Dryads, Napoleon, and Brawl. This is a big area. I mean, you can look at it geographically. It's a large part of the city of New Orleans. The study began in the summer of 2012 with an initial phase of discovery. I just, I just want to make sure that the people who are putting this project together understand there are a lot of people east of Elysian Fields. I got up to speak in front of this panel, a group of people, the guy came up to me, from, to, to me from the White House and hit me on the shoulder. His name was Chuck. He said, Mr. Woodrow, I'm from the White House, and I'm here to speak on Fresh Food Initiative also. And I just want to know if it's all right with you that I'm speaking on Circle Food. And that just kind of made me feel ready. I'm going to quit the hotel on Veteran. I got all them jobs. They working. And I told them to be there at 7 o'clock. Everybody was there at 7 o'clock. You know, so they're doing construction. And, um, <laughs> My brother's over the project, but I went around with 45 guys that have been in jail. 
and they're training them, and they're going to tell the whole hotel line to do that, so they want to work. They want to work. Four major... I, I, I just wanted to show the excerpt. This was actually a short um, kind of documentation of what we were doing that was to be placed on a website, really to encourage more people to participate in the whole process. And so you start to hear it. Boudreaux, for instance, opened up Circle Food Store, uh, and it was through a combination of federal, local, and, and state things. And, um, wonderful discussions happened all around. I think there were big expectations from the project uh, of what could happen. Uh, it's just a major step to uh, really say, we'll take a freeway down. And, uh, um, but still, we, we wanted to get the pulse of what was going on with people at that one. And here's another. This is um, something from, um, Actually, this is an excerpt from Bo uh, Buffalo. This is um, um, in the site of the unseen, part of a ongoing process of a documentary on Frederick Law Olmsted. And um, Buffalo became a very important city for Olmsted. This is older footage. The person who you see standing in the greenhouse is now mayor. He was council at that time, but Mayor Brown very much passionate about Olmstead. So. Uh, you're standing right in uh, the greenhouse in Martin Luther King Park, one of six Olmstead parks in Buffalo. <coughs> I am a Buffalo City Council member right in the heart, right in the center of the city of Buffalo. The park was first known as the parade. The park uh, was part of a system uh, that Olmsted had designed that linked uh, Delaware Park and Martin Luther King Park along what is now the Kensington Expressway, which is, was then Humboldt Parkway, which was a beautiful parkway where people could uh, ride ho horses, uh, where they could walk uh, with their families, where they could picnic, where they could sit out in, in nature. And sometime in the 50s, a decision was made to um, put an expressway right down the, the heart of the uh, Maston District, the heart of the city of Buffalo. And it really had the effect of um, setting off uh, a period of decline because it, it, it created a disconnect between communities at that time. So while the parkway, um, uh, through Olmsted's vision, had linked people of different uh, uh, ethnic backgrounds and um, uh, income levels uh, where they could interact with each other, where they could use this shared parkway. Uh, when the uh, expressway was put in, Martin Luther King Park kind of became the Black Park, and Delaware Park um, became the White Park. So oh, anyway, the, the thing on, on this that, that was uh, so interesting to me is that Buffalo is where Frederick Law Olmsted. This uh, is Jacqueline Dumont. Pew. Today is September 22nd in the mountains in the north of Argentina. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, it, it really became a, a, a place where he could stretch out beyond some of the initial political fights that he had in New York around Central Park and uh, Prospect Park. And so uh, there was something very uh, specific I wanted to get out of that. Plus, it was where my father was from, so there was a little personalized uh, story going on in terms of, of that. So um, I have a lot of questions about your film work, so what I'm going to hold them until the end. Okay. Um, because I want to talk really more generally about the scope of your career together and the kinds of projects that you've worked on, um, both locally and regionally, um, and think about them in terms of the way your influences and your kind of overall design philosophy has really informed the work that you do in terms of process, in terms of research, um, and just how you uh, define what landscape architecture practice is in 
in your office? So I'll start with the fact that, so I had a firm before <laughs> here in New Orleans. I guess I started it way back in 1992, Terra Designs. And, you know, I worked on the Riverfront Streetcar, Washington Artillery Park. I did a bunch of um, Head Start playgrounds. So I was doing a lot of, you know, I mean, the practice was going really well. I had, you know, over 10 Excuse people me. in the office and we were rocking, you know, Katrina <laughs> came. But the thing is, when Austin joined the firm, it just transforms everything. Um, the fact that he was way ahead in terms of what we do now in terms of using the visual image, I mean, he had been doing that way ahead. You know, in the 90s, he was already using the visual image, as you can see, um, because that he was a filmmaker. So it just transformed. And also, um, to be honest, <coughs> I wasn't really thinking that much back then about environmental justice or the community aspect, and Austin was an activist. He doesn't talk a lot about that, but he was in Oakland being an activist. So the combination of bringing someone, you know, and I will say that, you know, because I was building things, I had that kind of technical, I knew how you get a project from beginning to end. You know, I had built stuff, but it was, you know, it was landscape architecture, yes, and the, you know, beautification and parks and, or plazas that, and so him coming with his skills just kind of transformed everything. <laughs> you know, it just really transformed everything. Um, so, um, and, I, and I'll let you finish. And the main thing um, in terms of now, you know, after this transformation, you know, me with this technical and him with the social, cultural, and, you know, just the, the moving image <laughs> is amazing and bringing those, those kind of skills together. Um, is the, the point about community engagement. So, you know, like our philosophy is that it all begins with community engagement. And lots of times this is misleading because when people hear that, they say, oh, so you do little parks and you go out and do workshops and you do, well, community engagement to us is scalar, meaning, you know, we work, you know, um, with um, Reverend Edwins, Edwards in, in Plaquemine Parish. So from parish wide, down to, yes, a city block, you have to do community engagement. If you're doing a master plan, regional master plan, you have to engage. Now, the type of engagement might be different, but just because you're using community engagement doesn't mean that doesn't apply to all scales of projects. Yes, yeah, so, and um, Diane will tell you that I, I really, um, after Hurricane Katrina, sought her out for a number of years and couldn't quite catch up to, you know, w w where each I was other were. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so the, the fact was, I said, if anybody knows half the things that we need to know in New Orleans in terms of recovery, that Diane was a person. I, we would hear stories about you can't put this rail gauge up against this rail gauge. And she said, oh, yeah, I did it in such and such and such. And you, you go and You've been on the streetcar, it's there. I, and I was just like, oh, okay. That's what we needed to hear, you know? So it was, it's been that kind of combination backwards and forwards, you know, and, and that was, uh, you know, I think the beauty of, of some of that coming together, you know, in terms of, you know. Um, there was a point I was gonna make too, and in, in, in specifically around this slide, I, I, I think there's a lot that happens in there. That's Jackson, Mississippi. And, um, you know, to me, Jackson is a, has a beautiful um, set of buildings and a deep, deep history that if you do not engage yourself in that history and the people there, you can completely misread Jackson. And the potential to me is great but it's a struggle that, that has to happen for that city to really grow, grow into the things that it can. And so engagement becomes very important. This is, looks like a nondescript small uh, restaurant. It happens to be a very important uh, communication hub where President Obama has eaten, others have eaten and done their political uh, conversations in that one room where we're having that conversation. Okay, so um, 
the part of the process that I think is sort of interesting, and, and I would love to see you walk through some projects here at this point, um, is the way that over the last you know, 15, 20, maybe even 30 years of, of thinking and working on this stuff, you've been able to kind of um, start to see different categories and types of works and, and typologies that maybe um, exist outside of what maybe regular ordinary residential or, or public practice architects might look at. Um, and I wondered if you could kind of talk about those three categories of work that you um, have started to emerge in your practice. So um, we kind of group these into three categories, which are kind of, um, you know, the areas, or kind of like how we kind of think. So there's, you know, ecology, um, and this term, ecological poetics, it actually came from, we were putting together, together a proposal to go after um, a future ground, a project here, and Neotha, I get that one. Myra. Yeah, she, this, she actually came up with this. She was on our team. She works in Denver, for firm in Denver. And I really love that, <laughs> you know. I was like, that's what, that's, that's kind of what we do, um, ecological poetics. The poetic part is because it's really about, you know, community investment in terms of the ecology, which is um, really important right now. And yesterday I was in a resiliency seminar and the resiliency czar in New Orleans, Jeff A. Bear was here and he was talking about you know, how you kind of have to, we're doing all this green stuff and how you have to turn that into green jobs and to community investment. So that's one category. Um, the other category is about um, urban, urban infrastructure and recovery. And infrastructure is like really important to me. I began, you know, I decided to go back to school because I really wanted to, because people say, well, you have a degree in civil engineering. Are you going to be, and I said, no, it just makes me a better landscape architect. <laughs> and now I have a doctorate in civil engineering because I really, understand infrastructure and it's such a it makes such a economic social cultural impact so I physically wanted to understand it especially after working on Cleveland corridor um, and then the other one has to do with um, recovery and resiliency so we um, kind of divided these up um, so I'll kind of start with this project so this actually like I said was just kind of where we were looking at these lots, and this is in the L9, and part of um, doing this was about like getting the community together, because they're, they're over, right now there are about 700 vacant lots. Post Katrina, there were well over 1,000, there was a community of 18,000, now there's a community of just 6,000 in this area, 13 block area. Um, and so we, you know, we actually, um, our office is down there, so we're like, like part of the community, um, and we're really blessed that they like consider us part of them um, when we work with them. So we kind of, um, these, a couple of these pictures like show the vacancy, which every time I look at it, I always try to remember that people lived there because you can look at a vacant lot and you say, oh, this is potential, which it is. But it's also, from memory, it also used to be somebody's home. And so we've been like working with them to kind of like come up with what we should do or what they would like to happen in these, the potential in these places, because they're gonna shift, you know, it, it won't go back to what it was. So what, what's it gonna be? Um, and so one of the um, ideas was, you know, to try to do something that could make, that relied upon culture um, and also, you know, the in environment and the history and also had economic vi viability. So this is um, Keith and Chandra Calhoun, <coughs> who um, um, some of you went on our field session <laughs> and we actually went to their place and they're pretty amazing. They, they, they are from the Lower Nine, but now they're internationally known um, anthropologists and um, videographers and also photographers and so they kind of photograph the culture but um, one of the things that they wanted to do was um, a cultural arts district and which is basically a cultural arts district is a district where it's not an arts district for arts and entertainment it's actually a district where the arts produce so where the artists live the artists you know have their studios 
and then they're also like integrated into the community. So we've been kind of working with them on, and these are just like some of our sketches because I always believe you gotta draw this stuff out, you know? <laughs> and so I'm thinking we've been doing with them in the community um, about <coughs> where, where this stuff should happen. Um, and this is like the master plan. And we're lucky because there are vacant lots and there's also um, gap funding um, along certain corridors provided by the New Orleans Recovery Authority. So um, it all kind of coalesced that the vacant lots were along the gap funding corridor. Um, and um, it basically is gonna have, yeah, housing, a market. They really wanted a market because that whole area is a food desert and, um, and they wanted, you know, galleries and things that the community could participate in, but that were essential for the artists to, to, um, to um, you know, do their work. And also, um, Nora, when we were talking with them, with um, the director, Brenda Bro, she was happy because she, or excited because she's looking at this as a catalyst for further development um, along. And if you wanna talk about the next project. Yeah, this one is the um, park uh, a potential park space that uh, is next to the Gorilla Garden. Uh, and the Gorilla Garden is an effort that uh, Chinga Mawindo, who I think she's in that bottom uh, one, yeah, there is. Uh, and those who went on the uh, um, field, field session, they met her as well. Uh, and that's the um, lot that uh, we're looking at that could become a park space and a buffer from a very active uh, port um, and warehouse uh, system there that uh, is, has a lot of metals and has a lot of truck traffic and uh, comes right in the middle of a neighborhood. And uh, so uh, Diane has been very active in trying to move this from a, a uh, just a lot owned by the city to a park and done some design sketches for uh, Gorilla Gardens, which is located right next to that. The interesting thing, and I've got to bring out this part of it that we love to do both as educators is to involve uh, students and studios as catalysts for community organizations and for projects that can happen. And I think it's an important kind of contribution that can happen. I, I teach at LSU, Diane has taught at Morgan, and uh, actually some studios at LSU as well. And I've always felt that it was a very important thing that could happen in, uh, in engaging students in great interaction with, with communities so that once they uh, graduate and come out, they have a sense of what it is that these projects actually do and the impact that they have. And I, I wanna say that in terms of this block because one of the former students who's gone on to be quite successful in his own right as uh, doing planning and design um, actually stood before the council and um, uh, <coughs> or the uh, planning commission it was and got that <coughs> zoned as mixed use Historical, historic mi mixed use. Yeah, hi historical mixed use, acting in the interest of the community there. And so at least that was a first step, and there's many steps to go, but that was a first step in something that's heavy industry. Yeah, there. the important thing about that is that the port wanted it zoned industrial so they could continue to put heavy metals on it in mm -hmm. the middle of that neighborhood. And now because of the students doing the research so that the community and that student could go before and get it, you know, changed to um, HUMU, the port can't do that. And now um, we had great progress in that. It looks like we're really gonna, um, which move just happened forward. in a day, <laughs> we're really gonna get that site and, and move it forward. Um, we came up with this design with the community, which is um, bioretention, you know, which is really important because of flooding, stormwater, um, a incubator, um, uh, um, a kitchen, because the Gorilla Garden, which is next to this um, site, um, which we showed, the Gorilla Garden, <coughs> they do a lot of um, 
food security, food, food as medicine, um, kind of nutritional programs, but they don't really have the space and they need a kitchen. So we're gonna, and, and there are a lot of people in, in the community that make really good pecan pie and gumbo and all kinds of, you know, there's a, when we went the other day, there was a person that makes all this healthy vegan natural food. And so they really need a kitchen to kind of start their businesses. And then we're gonna have a playground because the kids kind of use it and then um, a garden. Um, and the great thing about this kind of work, most of the work we do, not all of it, but a, a large share of it is there's no RFQ. There's no RFQ to go <laughs> answer. What happens is um, people like Chandra and Keith and people like Jenga, we're so lucky. They come to us and say, we want to do this. So we help them find the funding. We try to help them get the land. And then eventually it turns into construction documents and then we get the work. You know, but we kind of make help them make these things happen. It takes longer, you're kind of putting a lot of risk out there financially, but you know, usually like this one probably is really gonna pay off and we'll get to do the you know, design and we'll get paid, but um, it's kind of great to make these things happen. Um, it is risky and yeah, you kinda, you're spending a lot <laughs> with no return at the beginning, but it's great. And then we do answer RFQs, you know, cause we have to, um, pay yeah. the fabulous employees <laughs> but but we we a lot of it is like that where there's no rfq there's just somebody that comes and say you know we think this should happen yeah. um and it's just <coughs> kind of exciting okay yeah this is a project that again there's been a lot of work you see the um uh wooded area up uh near the top it's a uh, 300 foot wide uh, about two mile long uh, stretch of land that the city owns in between, <coughs> in the lower Ninth Ward, in between Bayou Bienvenue wetlands on the upper side and the neighborhood on the lower side. And uh, there is an organization locally in, in the lower Ninth Ward, the uh, uh, Sankofa CDC, that decided to take it on as a project uh, and take a two acre part of it and add into uh, this uh, whole wetlands part that could serve as an educational tool for a lot of young people and, uh, and everybody really. And it happens in a very dynamic place in terms of water. <coughs> um, and that's a, for another discussion, but uh, that wetlands is becoming, uh, the, yeah, the triangle wetlands is becoming more and more fresh water because of the closing of the Mississippi River Golf Outlet. The uh, building that you see up in that is the Sewage and Water Board's treatment of uh, uh, sewage for this side of the river. And uh, they have uh, some simulation ponds for restoring cypress forest right there. So this has a lot of dynamic things <laughs> happening right there. And there is a little swamp to the west of uh, our site. And the thing is, it's been a wonderful challenge and we have relied heavily on engagement to have the appropriate information because that land has not sat idle for the years. It is very, you know, this was a heavily populated community there were people who had actually lived on that land at different points in terms of, of what we would call informal housing um, over the years. And um, so there's long histories, there's complications in the way the water works there. None of it is as seems. And um, uh, we were able to get a lot of good oral histories and oral stories, putting uh, um, our uh, staff <laughs> right in the middle of it as well. And um, it it's, has all the dynamics that you would think of in terms of a wetlands anywhere in Louisiana. Uh, uh, it's right there. Yeah, what I wanna say is, um, cause you'll probably say that's all that text bad slide. That, that's actually <laughs> two, those are two sheets from the stormwater management plan and um, which had to be, you know, um, um, submitted to the city to get approval um, because right now, um, we just kind of are at the end of permitting and hopefully in about a week we'll start digging ground. But um, 
the reason why I want to mention this is that it, it's really important. We're lucky, like the training that <coughs> people get <laughs> that come into your office. Mm -hmm. And we were really lucky because um, Sue, who's right there, wave your hand, Sue. Okay, so <laughs> Sue, because she, she, um, she graduated, I guess, a year ago, um, from a year or two ago, at, from LSU. And so because of her understanding of, you know, water, you know, having taken those water classes and really understanding that and, you know, like you, you have a time to get this thing done. You can, you do, and we, we, we work with our, you know, people that come, but it's really good when you have people that kind of know the science and, and you know, because of their training in school and can kind of come in and work and put this stuff together. So that's, um, that's really important. It is. Um, yeah. And so that's just, um, okay, so we, there's a whole 40 acres, and actually there's a grant out, um, and this is being done through um, Sankofa Community Development Corporation. It's pretty amazing. They went to the Sewage and Water Board, and no one believed it, and said, can we have this land <laughs> to do this project? And they said, okay, <coughs> like, do a do a little pilot project and we'll give you the 40 acres to do you know depending on how that goes and so they're getting a grant to do the rest of it and we're excited because that'll be so much more to work with so this is just a four acre um and the thing i love about this is you know that grading i love grading you know it's so funny <laughs> that you know we, we don't like you know landscape architects we're making that you know grading is really where things happen because it's what makes you know, the form, it's what makes water flow. You know, I love grading. So this was the cut and fill. This is the exciting drawing, <laughs> and which is, was essential because we had to, um, so we have cuts, because so we were trying to capture, you know, um, they want to capture the water. Yeah, they want to capture the water from the street so it can come in and, and, and get cleaned before it goes off into Lake Pontchartrain. And then because this is a wetland, so we really had to like try to figure out, so how far can, can we dig to increase the capacity? So we had to do these cut and fill sketches. And so grading is exciting stuff anyway. And then um, the other part is we um, wanted to enhance the environment. I don't think I put the, f a f I don't know if I put, yeah, I didn't. Um, so there's, there's a photo, which I didn't put on in there because right now, it's so exciting um, that there are like water moccasins and alligators. I mean, that's, a, that's one of the <laughs> issues with this project is that we're inviting people to come back into a place where there are, you know, 10 foot alligators sometimes <laughs> and 20 foot water moccasins, you know. Um, right now, you kind of go back there on your own, but once we make this path and invite you in, there's like liability, so we had to work that out like, you know, <laughs> where, because at first we had the path on grade, but you know, then we had to put a bridge and you have to have signage and direction and we kind of cheated. And so the city said, well, if you call it a maintenance path, then if they go on it, they're on their own. Mm -hmm. And if you, <laughs> and if you, you know, because you want people to come back Ow. and see the alligators, but you don't want them to get eaten. And, um, but we, we also tried to enhance, which was kind of exciting because they're all, it, the exciting thing too about the plant material there was like, what do you take out? Like, yeah. what, what is invasive and what is not? What is a weed and what is a good tree and what is a bad tree, you know? And what, what how much more, you know, new planting, because we're doing a lot of new planting, believe it or not, in this place and clearing stuff out. So making those kind of, you know, judgments, because you change the environment and the ecology. And one of the big things we did, and we work with the Audubon Institute on, you know, they want, you know, increase butterflies and the insect population back there. So this was a, another thing, I just cut it out of the report. We had to do a lot of research and reports for this little two acres, it was amazing. Um, this was like all about the butterfly population and the plant material we were gonna use. Did you wanna say something? No, <laughs> I, I, I was just gonna mention okay. um, that, that that was the case and that what, one of the exciting things about the 40 acres is really to see the connectivity all the way through. This is, uh, like I said, a complex system that feeds uh, into a larger system of control in the water and actually, <laughs> Um, there's so much infrastructure underneath 
you have to be careful with what you do in terms of the design. That's where the sewage pipes are actually headed towards the uh, treatment plant. So it, it, there is a, another level of complication. Yeah, so um, it, it's going to be an interesting site because things grow in New Orleans like the drop of a hat. So that was the big thing too. Now I'm working on the maintenance plan, like how much do you let come back, you know, and you know how do you balance it with the new, how you're trying to change things. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's gonna be kind of an ongoing thing. And as we move into the rest of the 40 acres, we'll have to continue to like look at that um, two acres to see how it's going, which will help us decide what we do as we move down the you know, down the stretch. Um, so this was, um, like we had to, so you have to, there's all this permitting and we had to go before the DAC and they wanted some renderings. So because this is about philosophy, I will talk about just mm -hmm. this. So I battle about these things, you know, I'm, everyone's coming out of school and there's this a big focus on programs about renderings and, you know, a lot of our, um, not all, but a, a lot of our students come from LSU because they're here and they come in, <laughs> you know, apply whatever. So and they, you know, they they can they can make things look fabulous. But I battle with these things, you know, because um, just the reality and and sometimes when you put these kind of renderings in front of communities, maybe not this one in particular, but there's this kind of they see this, they sometimes think this is a photo and they think this is exactly what's gonna look like. And, and then sometimes these renderings, even with the person, the renderer, I found with, like with young people, they render these things and then when you get them to do a construction document, there's this kind of disconnect because of the reality of, <laughs> you know, what, what that really means. Like how, how do you really make, draw that and make that, that thing that you envision happen? And then once they kind of understand as you're working with them on construction documents, you know, that, oh, that's not really what I meant. Now that I understand, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's great because it's beautiful communication and, and, and technology and, you know, the school, that's who's coming to us. Everyone has to do that. But there is like some caution in it. And that's why I always like to sketch and do things by hand. But these are great Bring because I'm even, even the, um, like I said, the, the city agencies, this is what they want to see. They, they want to see this. I mean, I've been in the DAC. Um, you sit and you, well, other people are going through their projects. And people have been told, well, come back. You know, we want to see. Oh, we, we went, we're at a community engagement thing, remember? Yeah. And the lady kept saying, and we had very nice drawn hand sections. And she kept saying, I want to see the 3D renderings. Where are the 3D renderings? <laughs> you know, because the community gets used to seeing that stuff. But you got to caution about, I don't know. I just want, I just, you know, I just have, you know, I, I talk to Austin a lot about it, the, the yeah. traps of it, you know, yeah. even though you have to do them now. Communities, the city, that's what they want to see. So I would put the alligator in the picture. Yeah. <laughs> that's me. <Okay>. No. <laughs> You're yes. setting expectations. I think that's important. Okay, so we're going to keep moving. So the next, the next um, area um, was um, about the um, urban urban landscape and urban design and um, the thing about the rise against the tableau rasa is um, that came out of, um, I put that there because I, I just last Wednesday came back from giving a lecture for the Baltimore AIA. They asked me to come because in Baltimore they're about to tear down about what, 20,000 vacant houses, amazing in Baltimore and how many thousands is it? Um, it's, you know, it's somewhere, it's maybe between 12 and 20. It's amazing the amount of houses. It's, they just got a, the state's gonna get um, money. Um, the governor is, is um, providing money or, you know, from the state to tear down these vacancies. I think they just tore down like 400, but anyway, so the AIA was thinking maybe there should be like a stop you know, like think about what they're gonna do before they just do this. And they right now just put out a Baltimore green plan. So a lot of this area might become green infrastructure. But, um, so they invited me to come because of, you know, Katrina where this kind of happened overnight. <laughs> all of a sudden there was just all this vacancy. Um, so that's where that um, um, Terra Raza was like about, like even if you, when you have all vacant houses or vacant land, that it's really not a clean slate. 
you know, that, that it, has, it has history and memory, and you can't like really do these things rush, you know, and even green infrastructure everywhere is not always the answer, <laughs> you know. Um, so so um, this project was in North Baton Rouge. Maybe you want to talk about it? Uh, this is an old hospital, uh, state-owned hospital, Earl K. Long Hospital. And there was a, a request by the state senator to really beef up what they were doing in terms of having community engagement on what was to happen with that site. Uh, the, the hospital was torn down. Uh, and Diane got involved uh, early on with what was going to happen with the big community engagement meeting. And this is your planning group here that, yeah. that, that actually was sitting with the state senator. This is in her district, and she was really trying That's to the state <laughs> uh, yeah, trying to get as much involvement from as many <clears throat> angles um, so that uh, when a plan got organized that it could really go far and have impact. So there were about, I'd say there was somewhere between 250 to 300 people who showed up for a charrette. Blew me away to see that out of that North Baton Rouge and, and <coughs> very enthused um, set of, uh, of people who really cared about what happened to that site. Diane worked with another person, is that in? She, she's, anyway, that, um, she uh, was a couple people who uh, were students at the time to actually work through um, a number of ideals that uh, came through that, that process. Um, and you can talk about it, I guess, even more in terms of some of the things that you all were Yeah, so this was really interesting. So we had them, you know, typical charrette stuff. We had a blink <laughs> and we had them in groups. And the great thing about it, though, we were really shocked about what came out of, um, if you look at this, if you got to look closer, um, um, a, you know, we expected that, um, like the, the one on the left, this one is kind of, actually was atypical of the group, but this is kind of what you get. We thought we'd get this. We thought we'd get, oh, they want housing and they want commercial. But if you look at most of what we ended up getting, and actually we, um, had another university come work with us. Um, Southern yeah, University. Yeah, Southern University, their business school. So they kind of took all those maps and then were able to like quantify the differences. <coughs> so what people really wanted, they didn't want like, you know, stores and things that you <laughs> think. They wanted like, you know, a small community health center. They wanted a gym. They wanted a library. They wanted um, a community center. They wanted a garden. They wanted these kind of communal things. You know, they didn't want like the movie theater or like the grocery store or the Walmart or the shops or the Starbucks. You know, they wanted a garden or they wanted a community center and they wanted a library. They wanted a senior center. They wanted an educational center. They wanted a little health care, you know. So and all of them were like that. There were just a few that were what we kind of expected. And that was um, and that was amazing. And I was kind of excited about the community process, I said, because if we hadn't have done that, we would have gotten it all wrong, mm -hmm. you know? And the reason why we thought differently was because where they are, it really is a food desert. There's like really no stores or no shops. They're in North Baton Rouge, they're out near the airport, you know, above Southern <coughs> University, and they don't have any shops or anything. But they, that's still not what they were thinking. They were thinking mm -hmm. about like each other and what kind of, what we need you know, um, emotionally and to be healthy people, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so this was, um, we did like a couple of master plan schemes and then after we did them, and what was really nice is we had the one charrette, the opening charrette where we did, the opening meeting where we did that kind of charrette ex exercise. But then we, we came back, you know, we met again and again. So that was really good to like, not just have that one big thing. We had more meetings with them. And when we came back, we had developed this questionnaire kind of deciphering, you know, um, the different elements, you know, and what was in the plan and trying to get their comments, you know, um, and giving them some visuals. 
Um, yeah, and so we did a couple of different plans, and then we, then again, you know, took all that information and came up well up with the results of what they wanted. And like I said, I mean, it was really wonderful. Like they wanted a library, you know, and um, a community center and a health center, and, you know, so was, and um, a fitness center, you know. So that's kind of what we tried to put into the final plan. And, and we think it'll have a tremendous impact on the area because um, politically, I, um, I think it had the, you know, the strength of, of, a, um, of having been worked as these are the ideals coming you know, from the ground up in terms of that. And the only drawback has been that you know, Baton Rouge and the communities around it took on <coughs> such flooding. Flooding, yes. In the, you know. Yeah, so this is kind of um, halted. Like what we tried to show you was what we're doing right now, the work we're, that's, you know, <coughs> some of that's about to go to construction. And some of it, like this, is kind of on halt because we were working on it fiercely and then the flooding happened in, the, in that community. So right now they're dealing with trying to get back in their houses and rebuild. It's like the last thing on their minds. But I wanted to show it because, I mean, just for myself, like, like I said, truthfully, had, had I been given this project and not, you know, with the senator, have, have had to go through that community process, I would have got it all wrong because I would have designed, you know, wow. some nice townhouses <laughs> and some shopping and, you know, and I thinking just doing my own analysis. You know, I wouldn't have thought about libraries and health centers and, you know. Um, so it, it just, it made me feel good because it made me realize, okay, these processes, headache as they are, um, they really are, you know. Important. Yeah, they're important. Yeah. Okay. And this is Southern University in New Orleans, um, and it's uh, above that road is the um, lake part of their campus, and it's right next to the University of New Orleans. Actually, it's a dividing line about <coughs> halfway through the uh, uh, map there. Uh, and below the road is their um, lower campus. So they took on a lot of damage so during Hurricane Katrina, um, extensive amount of damage. And uh, it's been a long time for them coming back. What we were uh, hired to do, you see the blue housing up near the lake. Uh, it's uh, very nice housing for students. And now students from a number of campuses come there, but uh, there was no real activity for them in that upper area. And so they were able to find some money and wanted us to do a soccer um, field. Uh, yeah, and they weren't sure if it was football or soccer. And um, so soccer with the ability to play football kind of one out there. So, so that, that was another thing. And we were thinking about it. In, in a complex way of thinking, the people who live right there, the people who could travel to that space and use it, and um, uh, soccer is such a, a, a growing thing in New Orleans as it becomes much more of the international city. <coughs> you see it all over the place. Yeah, so um, one of the things about this is, right now there is, um, and I'm probably getting these numbers wrong, <laughs> as I was getting the number of houses in, Baltimore. Sharon, you'll have to correct me and tell me how many houses <laughs> there are coming down. <laughs> but um, but yeah, <laughs> that are going, the vacant ones. Um, there, there's a um, federal money that's, this is, um, and there's probably a, a session on this. Um, there's a um, federal money coming in. This is Pontchartrain Park. And they're doing um, more of these um, canals there's like a big water wetland project going through here. This is the industrial canal, and this actually goes all the way through to the lower nine, and up here is Lake Pontchartrain. So when you look at this, you realize that, you know, New Orleans is a place that's surrounded by water. Um, and, um, and then the reason why we put this in the urban section, because it is, there's, you know, there's housing. It, it has a certain density to it within all this water and green. Um, 
And so one of the <coughs> things here um, in our plan is that they just wanted a soccer field. <laughs> <laughs> and two things, well, they really wanted a football field. So two things happened. We had a community engagement um, um, activity with the students mm -hmm. and the facilities and administrators. And so Southern um, at New Orleans, Southern University at New Orleans. Okay, so it, it is a HBCU. And if you know anything about HBCUs, <coughs> and I can say this because I taught at one, they're very kind of, you know, like very logical in, <laughs> in their thinking. So it took the students to say, you know, soccer, it's the new thing. So we got them to change to soccer. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is they just wanted to like do regular infrastructure. They had a pipe. There was a pipe here and they just figured we were going to put some drains and work with the civil and run the pipes into the big drainage pipe and that and drain our field and that be that. And so we had to really like fight with them and let them like just look at where they were. Like, look, you're <laughs> here. Look at all these, um, you know. Opportunities. Yeah, you know, there's already all this bioretention. There already are these ponds, and, they're, you know, the government's about to spend more money on more bioretention, and you want to put a pipe, you know. And, you know, so they were having a fit when we were saying, not only do we want you not to put a pipe, we want to <coughs> dig up your pipe. <laughs> so um, we, um, we came up with... Um, this plan for you know simple soccer field but the great thing was we were able to get them to dig up 700 linear feet of pipe and put in 700 linear feet of wetlands okay um so that's just i'll go through this that's just you know what we ended up having them do i don't know if there's any uh, uh, can, can we go water. back on the on the water oh. where, where, where you see the no the um the uh, yeah, that, oh, that one, one, that one, yeah. Yeah, so that's where they dug up the pipe. Yeah, dug up the pipe, next one. That, yes. A uh, 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 little story here, uh, uh, you know, it, it is <coughs> such a, a new thing, I think, for a lot of construction people to understand what you're trying to do because the whole movement has been get the water out of here, all right, and, and um, it, it, we, it was an interesting moment trying to get this right. Uh, uh, and I, I remember when the construction people put some extra cloth behind the- uh, Not extra, they put cloth. filter fabric in. On yeah, our spec, right. on our it, drawing back there, there was it, no it was, filter fabric. It, it, and they it, couldn't understand. So <laughs> on their own, they put filter fabric in yeah, there. Yeah, and and you can tell Austin had to go and pull it out and almost get sucked <laughs> into the- It, it was it was an interesting <laughs> yeah, so moment. He had to go in and pull out the filter fabric that they weren't supposed to put in because they couldn't understand how yeah, to the, put that it gravel. It backed off into the street and everywhere. Yes. And I was like, oh man, <laughs> this, yeah. is, this is so not we, what yeah. we had in mind. And, yes. uh, because they didn't understand. And so actually it's quite beautiful, yeah. you know, and, and, growing and green. It, it, and you have to, I think, work with contractors in terms of that as, as really understanding this shift that's going on. Yeah. And one thing we did do um, is we, um, and I think I had shown this at a session last year, we, we, we transplanted a lot of plants. Um, we learned from that because a lot of them died because a contractor, again, didn't realize you can't take dug up plants and just lay them on the ground. Like you do ball <laughs> yeah. and There's a yeah. system. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but anyway. Yeah. Okay, and so the last area was just about cultural, and this is, well, we're quick, there's only one project we're showing here. And this is a project that we're working on right now. Um, Sue is heavy in construction documents. Um, and um, so this project's really interesting because it was controversial. There was um, that sculpture, which looks like an egg. That's Martin Luther King. And so when it was unveiled in 1976, the, the, I mean, the, community was in an uproar because they expected a figure of Martin Luther King, a, you know, your typical. But they chose Frank Hayden, who was a, um, a really wonderful modern, you know, in that time he was a contemporary sculptor. And so he, in his, he was told you're supposed to do a figure of Martin Luther King and to him like the eggs represent life and the hands reaching you know, because Martin Luther King was about crossing borders and people coming together, and there are quotes from his Have a Dream speech inside. So after all these years, the community actually gets it, and what they call it, they call it the abstract. 
because they, <laughs> they said, you know where the S, <laughs> that's what they call it. And every year the, um, the Mardi Gras Indians come down and on MLK Day and they put like a bouquet of flowers inside. They have a parade. They parade down there. And there's a second line behind. They put a bouquet of flowers, and it's it stays there for like like almost it just dies till, there. Till, till it, yeah, yeah. Till it it's gets. pretty amazing. Anyway, so it got in disrepair, and um, we and that was a project that actually had an RFP. <laughs> we went after it, and um, so we were able to get it. And we went through this community design process, and um, there were some little things that were really cool, like when we had our first meeting, instead of like putting people at little tables, we put them at one big circle so we can like everybody equal. And then we had like these working sessions and then the best part was then we actually went out onto, we walked to the plaza, which is really eye-opening because I don't care how many, you know, sketches or plans, when people like got on the site, they were like, oh, we understand. And mm -hmm. they climb up on the sculpture and, you mm -hmm. know. And so that was really <coughs> exciting, like going out to the sculpture and then coming back to continue to work. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, and then same thing, like, so we came out with a bunch of ideas. Um, and um, the thing is, they, we're gonna take the sculpture away, have it restored, cleaned, but we're gonna bring it back. And the main thing was the pedestal, like, right, the old design that was designed when it was put there, um, the designer put the sculpture in a fountain. Of course, the fountain died, so it's in, been in disrepair for years. Uh -huh. And then people climb in it so they can see the quotes. So we realized the important thing is we have to get people to be able to come, you know, so it was whether do we put it at grade and do we elevate it, and people kind of like the idea of it being elevate it symbolically, but being able to touch it. So it's like, how do we fit and be able to read? So how do we figure that out? And then there, um, there's a lot of community along there. It's an area kind of in flux or gentrification. So this plaza was important so that the, the existing community still feels that they have a place in all this change that's happening on Aretha Castle Haley. Um, <laughs> new galleries and condos and shops and all kinds of stuff happening there. And so that it's a place for them. So we came up with four schemes and we had people kind of talk about them and vote on them um, and that was that. And then we came up with um, a final scheme and we had to do alternate base bid and alternate because the budget is never enough. <laughs> so we had to figure out, okay, how do we do it? And it, it, it there's <laughs> another interesting aspect ahead, on sure. this it, and we've had, it, had these moments with the client and with uh, others about it. Right underneath it is a canal and it <coughs> becomes the 17th that. Street Canal, which caused a lot of flooding during Katrina. It's called the Malpany Canal right there. And we, we wanted a way to really open up the plaza. <laughs> and everybody's like, there's no way you will open this yeah. So our initial scheme, <laughs> we actually presented it. And it's what the community wanted was to dig a hole in a circle <laughs> in the top of this covered canal and then put, you know, like a glass surface or a block surface that people could walk on, but actually know that there's water on there. Under yeah. Understand that all these neutral grounds, medians that you see are really, almost all of them in New Orleans have water under them. They were either canals that were covered or culverted. And so we wanted, and we thought, and we, um, we probably could have had it, you know, the, we have a good relationship with the sewer and water board and they probably would have went for it. It wasn't, it really wasn't the city. Mm -hmm. It was the client. The client just would not, was worried about liability and people breaking the glass and all you know, craziness and just wouldn't, you know, the sewage and water board really, they have, and even the city, like um, the Jeff Bear, the resiliency are, the fact that we have stormwater management plans. I mean, New Orleans is really thinking about how we live with water. The city is ready for, inter you know, to get people mm -hmm. to know it's there, but it was the client. We just couldn't get them to budge, so we had to get rid of it. And now there's going to be a piece of the circular. is still going to be there, and there's going to be, so, be a piece of art. And this wave pattern is what is to get you to kind of feel like there's water. Um, and, 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 and it brings out, you know, you know something like a, uh, what Halpern would have done now. You just can hear, oh, no, lawsuit. Uh, we, we, no. <laughs> but he did it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 
Um, and this, so, so it'll step up, and you'll be able to step up there. And I think, you know, if you can get up there and read the I have a dream quotes, you'll know, okay, this is king. <laughs> I get it. But when you drive past there, I, I have to admit, you know, all the years I lived here, I would drive past there and say, oh, it kind of looks like Beetlejuice. Okay, you know? <laughs> and then someone said, that's Martin Luther King. But so you'll be able to walk right up to it, you know. And it is an interesting sculpture, it but really now is. you'll get the real meaning of it. H H Hayden was a very talented sculptor. Yeah, that was sculptor. the... Um, he, he really was, and he, I, I could see him really pressing everybody's... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, I'm going to have to stop you guys because okay. I want to make sure that we have time for questions. Um, so if you do have questions for these guys, please step up to the microphone. Um, and while you're kind of shuffling and getting your nerve up, I'm going to ask a few of my own. Um, so, uh, uh, so many things popped up when you were talking. Very early in the talk, you, you kind of did this little imitation of people talking about community engagement as this little thing, <laughs> yes. right? You did this little, like, and I, I think about this all the time because uh, the perception of that work um, in the world, but also in the profession, um, it's really diminutized. It's really sort of seen as this low, small scale, um, unheroic, unarchitectural kind of like work, and yet, if you look around in cities, the same kinds of things that people are doing at the Gorilla Garden get kind of rebranded by you know white architects in cities and called tactical urbanism. It's not different, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's these kind of use of resources um, in the city when there isn't a lot to work with in terms of money. And I wondered if you would talk a little bit about perceptions of this work and specifically what are some misconceptions that maybe your colleagues have about the kind of work that you do? I'll start with that. I, I myself, like I, I felt, I said, I don't want. I'm a designer. I don't want to be called a community, community engagement person. I have all these years of design. I make form, you know. Doing that again. <laughs> yes, you know. I'm not, you know, because you know you feel like the designer is here, the community engagement, you mm -hmm. know. But what I realize is that as a designer, the more I do these this outreach, it really, it really, and I hope it came through in the slides. It really impacts the form making. You know, it makes exciting form. It makes me a better designer. And community engagement is worthless if it doesn't translate into form. You don't do it just to do it. You don't do it to check the box, which happens all the time. <laughs> but you do it because we are about making form. We are. I mean, landscape architecture to me is about making form because form is where people live. And that's why I want to I want to impact where people live. And so in order to do that, I have to make form. You know, and community engagement really impacts that. So, you know, I, I myself had to learn to embrace it because I used to think of it as, you know, people think, oh, you're just, you're not a designer because, you know, but I realize I am a designer. I mean, that's the end product. You know, that's what I want to do. I like to make beautiful things that make people's lives better. But engaging with the community is what not only makes it beautiful, <laughs> It also makes it last longer because they feel like it's theirs. They become stewards of it. They They're not going to write graffiti on it or rip it up like the park <laughs> that's existing yeah. because they feel like, okay, we helped shape that. We understood, oh, we see what, you know, oh, yeah, we were a part of that, you know, plan, and we see. So they embrace it. Yeah, th there's no vandalism <coughs> that has ever happened on that site, which is people at first might not have understood it, but they were like, uh, there's something to this, and you know, and and so it doesn't uh, have that, and which says that there's a lot more selectivity, and a lot more decisions being made by people when we see, you know, writings on walls mm -hmm. and other things that there are aesthetic decisions being made that may not be the aesthetics that we subscribe to, but they are looking for uh, an opportunity for engagement. Yeah, it's a design critique, right? Yeah, That's yeah, good to see yeah. for you. Yeah. Hi, please. Um, hi, thanks uh, for the presentation. It was uh, great. Um, and uh, I've been involved in a lot of projects that help have different pieces of the community process or engagement, and I've done a lot of different, had a lot of different forms to, to do that. And I was just wondering if you could give a little more insight from your experience about um, kind of a two-part question reaching out, finding the right people and finding the right way to engage with the right people and making sure that it's a kind of a holistic picture of that particular community. 
and the way that you, you know, any insights on how you actually get to the right people. And then secondly, uh, from, from your experience, what, what do you think is the most kind of productive way that you've been able to kind of pull that information out or kind of co converse about the, the, um, the, the important issues and what are the tool, uh, tools or, you know, kind of best tool that you've found to get that information? I, 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 one of the wonderful tools I've seen lately in Kofi Boom really was the one that made me see that was the use of cell phones as both uh, devices that people can use to tell their own stories and to document things that you uh, may want to pick up later because it's all point of view in that kind of way. Um, there was a, a study done in the Lower Ninth Ward, which was uh, part of the Center for Sustainable Engagement and Development did with another group here that uh, really had started seeing how the new GIS things were being used. And so sent a whole bunch of people from the neighborhood as well as we uh, got students to volunteer and they went to all 7,600 lots in the Lower Ninth Ward because everybody's blight study was different. Nobody had the, the database that made sense up against another database. So that they went to all 7,600 lots as a blight study. And um, the, this is in 2012, so there was a way of weighing this that engage people in terms of this should come down, this should not come down, that kind of thing. You had all that. And then you were to interview people if they could give you commentaries on the buildings. And one reason that study never went wide is that people started saying, oh yeah, that two doors down is where this and this and this is happening. And you're like, oh boy, what am I to do with that information? You know? <laughs> and, 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 but, but, from a design standpoint, <coughs> it's invaluable to then know what you know what's happening with it. So that's one of the tools to me that right off is that. But we have other things. Well, what I want to say, um, the most important thing to me is when you start community engagement is to say I don't know. I mean, you <laughs> you have to realize that you don't know. Even when I'm working in the lower nine, where you know, we live in our, our offices, you know, I, I always start off with, I don't know. I don't know, they know, and when they inform me, then we will know. And the reason why I bring this up, there's been, um, like, there has been, like, some hostile um, things that have happened where communities have gotten really upset and turned on designers, especially, you know, a few years after Katrina because a lot of them have felt and articulated that you hire these consultants and you pay them to get the information from me. <laughs> you know? And then not only do they get my information, but then they interpret it and what comes out is not really what I was even thinking. Or telling you. So that's the great thing about techniques where either cell phone or like what we call experting, letting them be the expert, letting them not only help with the information, but really work on the analysis, which what we try to do, let them like somehow find ways that they can directly impact, you know, and let them feel that you're not, you know, because what happens is it comes in like you have these little breakouts, you take their stuff, oh, we know everything, now we're gonna go and do our thing, you know, so you have to kind of find a way to make them feel like, you know, they're really the experts in their community and you're just facilitating them to create the design. Mm -hmm. That's that that works best. And it happened here because there were a zillion billion charrettes. You can't go in the you can't say that word in certain communities and people <laughs> come out with pitchforks, not another one of those. You know, so you know, it forced us to be more sensitive and creative about how you make them feel like yes, it's their information and we're facilitating them into making you know what hap you know what they want to happen happen not we're taking your information and we're translating it and here it is what we've come up with mm -hmm. you know yeah. and and with um, big screen televisions in people's houses too uh, we we talk about the kitchen table uh, um, workshops or dialogue where where you're sitting 
and you can plug in a, a laptop to somebody's TV and have a wonderful discussion with them and a few neighbors, you know, about what they think, and and they can see it in real time. You know, some of the ideas. Yeah, don't do your engagement in big, huge groups. You know, like really do the real engagement in smaller groups and you know maybe you come back in big groups or if you're gonna do big groups you need to do a couple several meetings so people feel like they're really working on it or do what we you know those kitchen table workshops where you're going out into smaller groups and working with people and, and then maybe coming back so they feel like they own it yeah you know? and um, about finding uh, how, do you have uh, any strategies on making sure you have the right people at the table or is that just project-based? Uh, yeah, I, I, I was going to say that's more, you know, what is the project? And, and I think it's from the years of having that kind of engagement where you can kind of read quickly, you know, what is the political landscape? What's the cultural landscape? What is the social landscape of the problems as much as you can understand it before you even get in yeah I was gonna say you you just have to know the community you're working in and you know like lots of times we work in places outside of New Orleans where we don't know anybody mm -hmm. so we like you got to go and spend a little time there find out like I said acknowledge that you don't know and try to find who who really knows you know and try to find that out from because sometimes you'll someone you know, I've had the case where they'll say, oh, you should talk to so-and-so, and then you find out everybody in the neighborhood hates them. And you <laughs> <laughs> so you have to kind of, you know, you know, find out, try to find out who really knows, you know, and who's really invested in the community. And because there are people that people listen to and, you know, who's been there for a while, mm -hmm. you know, kind of do your work, your, you know, do some the head work before you go in. You can't Google yeah. this. You know, you can't, you can't yeah. Google like who knows everything in Jackson. Yeah. Like you just, you gotta go yeah. and be there. Yeah. We stumbled in that Jackson. We stumbled across that peaches. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't know, I, I didn't know Jackson that kind yeah. of way. And yeah, we were hanging out. You guys going yeah, hang out. We were hanging out. Hanging out and and <laughs> this guy kept talking to us, and we kept engaging him. And he said, "Well, come across. I'll unlock the door." And, and that's <laughs> how we got in there. I mean, that's great. <laughs> You had a question in the back first? Yes, I, I wanted to just say thanks um, to Austin and Diane for an interesting conversation. I want to pick up on some of the, the, the discussion um, that's just been happening. And it, it, I wondered how you balance the task of you know, introducing design ideas or solutions that maybe folks have not ever really been exposed to before, um, and yet, telling them that you know their ideas are the ones that are going to be incorporated how do you how do you introduce new ideas and get a positive a positive reception or at least a thoughtful reaction um, and so uh, increase the design vocabulary of all the folks that you're working with um, it, it, for, for I know in the lower ninth ward one of the big divides that happened early on <laughs> was that often we had studios with students in there who were knowing what they had been taught that there wasn't going to be a hundred percent return to that neighborhood. Uh, the, you know, in terms of if you just looked at climate change, there, that wasn't going to happen. But if you put the politics on top of the climate change, on top of a whole lot of other issues it just was not going to be. And there were people in the neighborhood that absolutely took the hard line, everybody back, everybody in, <coughs> in, in their lots again. And it, it was an interesting dynamic that, you know, I know I often would say to the students, you have to stick to your guns. You can't be, uh, you can't be, you know, um, um, disrespectful in any kind of way, but you have to stick to some of those realities and have a dialogue about them because, in fact, something else will shift in, in the course of it. And that's what happened for a lot of the people who were steadfast on every lot will come back is that they understood 
more than we thought they understood. They knew if they didn't take that stand at the very beginning, nobody would be back. Mm -hmm. and, and so it was a real hard line that they had to take and they, under, they even understood why they were being opposed so in that. And eventually they began to say, okay, well maybe not that street, maybe not th that block, but in return I want these things, you know, as a neighborhood. And you start to see that kind of negotiation. Um, I'll just say that actually in my experience, I, I have, I've been having more a harder time convincing clients and cities of new ideas than the community. <laughs> the community's like, yay, then you go to the client in the city and it's like, what? But um, with, with, a, with, with communities, two things that always helps. If you take them to another, for instance, um, the, it, it was very um, difficult in New Orleans because people died. I mean, you know, there were lives, uh, over a thousand <coughs> lives lost in Katrina. And so water is for a lot of communities, especially African-American communities, they don't want to see bioswales. Because first of all, they think they're weeds. They're like, why are we building ditches? And let's cover that stuff up because my, you know, my nene died, you know, in the flood. So like, you know, so there are these emotional things. You're right. And it, trying to get them to understand the design idea of really this is going to help that. And one way is if they, if you can take them to a, a not, you know, a more affluent, com another community that has that and show them, then they're like, oh, okay. So if you can show them and if you can really physically show them, I mean, you can show them pictures, but it's nothing like saying, let's get on, I've done it. Let's get in the car. Or let's get on the bus and let's go, you know, uptown and see the bio flails. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, well, they got them. Okay, we want some, you know? So you really have to do that. You have to like physically show them if it's something new and different. And it's not because they're ignorant or anything. Yeah, they're just, you, if you understand the logic too, if you, un something might seem like, oh, they don't really know. But then if you understand, understand the history and the logic why they don't want them. It's not because, you know, African Americans don't like ecology, which I've heard. <laughs> it's because you lived in a place where a thousand people died and it was water. And once you understand that, then you can say, okay, so where do I take them to get them to see this? You know? That's that's a good question because that's really important and it comes up a lot in our work. Okay. I think we have time for like one or two more questions. Hi. No. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your views of gentrification? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, well, I, I actually, uh, I have a long version. No, and we make, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're asking Five for minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, it's much more complex than yes. we we want to come to the table and deal with. Um, I started really for some other reason reading about Frank Horn, and I suggest you look his name up. And um, um, he, he was like the African American dealing with housing coming out of the 40s into the 50s. He saw it coming and said, okay, we got a real crisis that's going to happen with all this housing that's going to be built after the war and we have to speak to it now. And I actually had looked at his name because I was going back and trying to figure out who started transforming the concept of the open city. And he was one of those early users of that um, name. And it had all to do with his understanding of how that racial divide is such the driver of the American city. Um, and what happened, I think, after World War II was much more of this kind of individualized effort. If you see it with Lorraine Hansberry's father's mm -hmm. suit that went to the Supreme Court and the whole thing, it was just the individual had a right to be in this house. And what was not really being looked at is the way that the city had been organized, much like a, um, um, I was going to say Ponzi scheme or lottery scheme where, you know, this is absolutely a white neighborhood, absolutely a white neighborhood. You cannot touch 
around that border. Okay, get out now. And, and everybody gets out, and the last one out, you know, is kind of stuck, all right, in, in this kind of situation that has happened. All of a sudden, you know, this becomes valuable over here, and you start to see this kind of, uh, of uh, arrangement start to happen. So that's a kind of overarching thing. And if you see it as that, then you can start to work backwards in and say, wait a minute, okay, what are we really doing here? Do we, do, are there easier ways into making mixed arrangements of uh, economies and communities? And I think we haven't dealt with those bigger questions, and so we say, isn't gentrification a shame? And, and then we all do what we do every day, you know? Well, um, th there's a developer we've been working with, um, um, EVI, and you know, they believe in um, gentrification without displacement. I personally, personally believe, and I'll even say I know, that populations are going to shift. Um, as someone, I was talking to somebody here a day ago, and they were saying, you know, the New Orleans, it was Jeff Baker, <laughs> he was mm -hmm. saying how, you know, there were Italians and Germans here, you know, French, you know, and even before that, there were some Gambians, and, you know, and the population shift, you know, a big shift happened with Katrina, and even if it had because of, um, you know, market forces and economics, populations are going to shift. It's no way we're going to get around, with, around it. So it's like, how do you handle it? You know, what is the balance? The problem to me is when it just goes, to, you know, when it go, when there's like total displacement. And then the other <coughs> thing about gentrification, it's a falsehood that, I mean, depending on how you <coughs> define the word, that African Americans or poor communities or communities of any color and don't want better neighborhoods. You know, they like Starbucks. They want a whole food, <laughs> you know, the things that come. They want, you know, tree-lined streets too. The things they, they like to have transit-oriented development. The problem is usually when that comes, they go. And it's like, how do you um, find a way to bring those things? They want higher property values. I mean, a lot of African Americans own their homes, but if you're in a neighborhood without those things, your values, they want their property values to go up too. So it's a falsehood that they don't want, that those communities that are being displaced don't want the value, <coughs> the economic, you know, and even social, because you get better, you get better police, fire, there are studies that show it. You know, the same neighborhood gets better police and fire protection. They want all that too. It's just that they don't want total displacement. And so how economically do you, do you, um, you know, make that happen? That's, it, it's, it, it is not, like you said, it's very complicated. Yeah. It's not a, you know, black or white issue. <laughs> All right. I'm not, no, I'm afraid we have to wrap up. I'm sorry for the last person whose question um, lingered. We can, we'll all be here later afterwards. Um, thank you so much for joining me with Design Jones, and please. <laughs> <laughs>